harassment, threats, poisoned water, and bombs sent to unsuspecting Canadians. This case spans nearly 20 years. In the spring or early summer of 2004, a modeling agency in Toronto started receiving threatening letters. Some of them were typewritten and some were assembled from cut out newspaper. The author of the letters claimed to be part of the Russian mafia. This was both disturbing and frightening, but no one knew who could be sending them. Why the Russian mafia? would be interested in any of the employees of this agency. In July of 2004, two Toronto talent agencies were each gifted a case of bottled water. The water cases were each accompanied by a letter stating the water was part of a promotional gift from a well-known water company. Happy to receive the free gift, the receptionist at one agency opened the sealed bottle and took a sip of the water. She immediately realized something was wrong with it. She held up the bottle and looked at it and saw the water was cloudy. It tasted sour and had an odor. She called her manager over and showed him. Upon examining the bottle, the manager noticed a pinprick hole in the top of the cap. They examined the rest of the bottles in the case and found they all had pinholes in the tops. In another part of Toronto, the other talent agency who had also received a promotional gift of a case of water, an employee there noticed right away something was off. On one of the bottles, there was a white crusty substance around the top. Upon closer examination, they discovered those bottles had pinpricks in the tops. The promotional letter that came with the water, ostensibly from a big well-known water company, was full of grammatical errors. The manager contacted both the water company and the police. The water company neither sent or even had such a promotion. In another part of Toronto, a judge received a 12-pack of bottled water with the same promotional letter. Employees at a CIBC bank in Toronto also received the same gift. One of the employees drank some of the water and became ill. The illness eventually went away on its own and could not be confirmed as being as a result of the water. These incidents went unsolved for the time being. On August 11th, 2007, in the area of Victoria and Lawrence in Toronto, a man retrieved a package from his mailbox. He went inside and opened the package. It exploded in his hands, sending shrapnel and nails shooting in every direction. It shattered a glass coffee table. He was injured, but he survived. On August 19th, 2007, a Toronto lawyer retrieved a package from his mailbox. Attached to the package was a receipt from a legitimate courier. It turns out that courier delivered no such package. The lawyer noticed a petroleum odor emanating from the package. He called the police. He was right. Inside the package, there was a live bomb. The bomb contained nails and a flammable liquid. Two package bombs in Toronto in such a short period of time was enough for police to issue a warning to the public. The bomber had other ideas. A couple of days later in Guelph, Ontario, 105 kilometers away, a man named John Becker noticed a Canada Post Express Post envelope at the rear of his house. When he opened the package, he saw a soft cover book inside. He reached inside to pull it out, but it was stuck. He pulled on it and heard a snapping sound. There was a cord attached to it, meant to detonate it. He looked down at what he was holding in his hands. The soft cover book had its pages taped together, a bulge in the middle of the book, which turned out to contain nails, 
and batteries taped to the front of it. Although he hadn't heard about the Toronto bombings, it was obvious what he had in his hands. He called police. Police detonated it and confirmed it was indeed a live bomb. Guelph police, knowing about the bomb events in Toronto, contacted Toronto police. None of the bomb victims had any idea who might want to harm them. Police were able to figure out that they all had dealings with one person in common. He was 37-year-old Adil Arnaud, and he lived in Toronto. But was he capable of this crime? And why would he do it? What had all of these people done that was so terrible that he went to such an extreme? Most cops don't believe in coincidence, but coincidence alone won't get a conviction. The last bomb victim had his own renovation business and managed a property in Guelph, Ontario. In 2003, Arnott lived in one of the Guelph properties. He was evicted. He blamed Becker for this. Also, Becker had previously called the police about him. Arnott had wanted to acquire M16 machine guns and a grenade launcher and asked Becker where he might be able to get those things. Becker reported this to the police. While nothing could be done about it at the time, it turned out to be valuable information later. The first bomb victim was a former roommate of Arnott's. Arnott didn't like him. The second bomb victim, the Toronto lawyer, had represented Arnott in two civil lawsuits, but when he came in wanting to launch a third, the lawyer refused. The case was frivolous and, as the lawyer put it, ridiculous. This lawyer had also assisted Arnott in a criminal harassment case that case went well for him, all things considered. While there was no way he was going to get away without a conviction for that one, he did get a conditional discharge. What that means is if he had abided by the court's orders for a period of time, he could walk away from the whole thing without a criminal record. That brings us to the judge who received the tainted water. That was the judge who gave Arnott the conditional discharge. He had been given an opportunity, yet decided to see it as being wronged. The criminal harassment he was convicted of? Well, that was against the manager of one of the talent agencies. Mr. Arnott wanted to be a model and an actor and wasn't getting the work he wanted. He blamed the talent agency and claimed they were not working hard enough for him. He sent letters, faxes, and made repeated phone calls threatening the people there. He was ordered by the court to stay away. It looked like he was gone. But then many months later, they started getting the mysterious threatening letters. After that, they also received a gift of poisoned water. Mr. Arnott was unhappy with the second talent agency for the same reasons, so he sent them the same gift. The CIBC? Well, at one time they froze his bank accounts. He had to have his revenge. The police had not yet put the bombings together with the poisoned water, but it was only a matter of days. There was already an arrest warrant out on him for another separate case of harassment. Police would be able to arrest him on that warrant. First, they put him under surveillance. This would only last one day. On August 30th, 2007, Arnott went to a gas station in the Thorncliffe Park area of Toronto. While he was there, police made their move. They surrounded him and arrested him. It turns out he was on his way back to Guelph to finish the job on Becker. In the trunk of his rental car, police discovered more bombs. Given they were at a gas station, they didn't want to try to disarm or detonate them there. 
in a historic event that closed the Don Valley Parkway and the Gardner Expressway. Those are two of the biggest roadways in Toronto. To give you an idea of how big this was, about 135,000 vehicles a day travel the Don Valley and 140,000 travel the Gardner. Police carefully put the bombs into an armored truck and slowly drove it on the now empty roads to a place called the Leslie Street Spit. There, they could detonate the bombs. The explosion could be heard a kilometer away. Police searched his room which was in the basement of a Toronto rooming house, and found an extensive cache of explosives and bomb-making equipment. Imagine having to live in the same building or the same neighborhood. They also found writings that included things such as, we are going to strip the flesh from your bones, and it's time for you to die. A search of his computer revealed he'd done searches on potential targets including a Jewish high school and the address of former police chief Julian Fantino. He'd also done extensive research into poisons, including ricin. The information in his room revealed he had planned to put ricin into water bottles and give them to his perceived enemies. That's when they recognized he was also responsible for the unsolved case of the tainted water being sent to several people and businesses. It doesn't end here. He ends up getting away with some of this and the Crown would have to fight to keep him in jail and protect the public. He was charged with eight counts of attempted murder for sending water which was believed to be laced with ricin three counts of attempted murder for the bombs he sent, three counts of causing an explosive device to be delivered, and two counts of possession of an explosive substance. Three counts of causing an explosive device to be delivered were stayed, in keeping with case law that says a person can't be convicted of two charges that result in the same act. He was originally convicted on everything else, and the Crown successfully argued he was a dangerous offender and should receive an indeterminate sentence. He appealed. It had been proven that he laced the water bottles with a substance called dimethyl sulfoxide, which is an industrial solvent. This substance alone would be unlikely to kill anyone but would make the body better absorb ricin or other poisons. Back then, the Center for Forensic Science did not have the capacity to test specifically for ricin, so it was never proven that ricin was actually in the bottles. In 2015, Arno won his appeal and was acquitted on the eight charges of attempted murder for the water bottles. That meant he could get a new hearing on the dangerous offender and get out of jail. The Crown knew that would pose a great threat to the public. The Crown set to work and won the hearing, but he appealed again. While in custody, Arnott spent time making copious notes about bomb making. He expressed a sense of justification for what he'd done he expressed a lack of empathy for the victims and a total lack of remorse. A judge said that he had a greatly magnified sense of his own victimhood. Ultimately, the Crown won and his dangerous offender status was upheld in 2022. I want your opinion, so please stay with me while the credits roll. I'm new to this YouTube thing and I want to know what you like. Do you think videos are better with or without background music? What do you like and not like? What kind of content do you want to see here? Let me know what you think and thanks for watching.